Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Langdon White, and uh, welcome to uh, DevConf CZ. Uh, if, uh, if you just came for me, that's cool. I really appreciate it. But I really, really hope you've been attending the other sessions. Uh, I'm sure, uh, you know, whatever you attended was great. I know the things that I went to have been really awesome. Uh, we're here to talk about uh, some research work that some students have been doing. Uh, and it's a uh, particular, sorry, it's a little project called Profit. Uh, and what it's about is uh, trying to analyze uh, microservice applications. Uh, we have a bunch of speakers uh, as part of this keynote, um, but we're going to lead off with the kind of the professor who's behind the project, uh, Professor uh, Tomas Czerny. And uh, he's going to come on and introduce the uh, project. And then we'll introduce all the people who are speaking kind of as we go. Uh, so. Um, Dr. Cherney, do you want to uh, share your screen or share your video? Hello, everyone, and greetings. So I'm going to tell you something about the project that we are involved in. So if we could jump to the next slide, like that. Okay, that's me. And uh, now about the project. So I believe that most of you are here today because uh, we share the same passion about microservices, and we like to develop microservices. So what we can typically do with microservices is nicely divide the team so that someone is developing one microservice, another team is developing another microservice, and so on. Why we do that? Well, because this is the mainstream direction these days, right? So what do we know about microservices? They are self-contained and we can deploy them anytime we want. Well, this has many benefits, but it could lead into some sort of issues, especially when we have multiple microservices. So what could what could happen here? Well, I like to talk about it like a black box view versus a white box view. So if you are the developer of a particular module, you of course know everything about your module. But if you are talking to the team that is developing some module that you are interacting with, you don't know much about it. So you can see it as a black box, right? And the sort of same situation is happening when you pass off your microservice to the sysops and they are deploying it. They know everything about the deployment, they know everything about the platform, but they don't know that much about uh, the specifics and specific aspects of your microservices. So there are times where we would like to have the holistic view. However, microservices do not provide us with a holistic view. So next slide, please, Langdon. And naturally the question comes, how can we get the holistic picture of the overall distributed system? So there is something that is called software architecture reconstruction. And as you can see, this is sort of a process where we want to build from this whole distributed cloud, the holistic picture of what's going on. Well, we could do that manually, and this is how it's most done most of the time these days. But what if we would like to sort of make it automated? So let's look into what would the holistic picture give us if, if we had it. Let's go to the next slide. So first of all, we understand the system, right? For instance, we want to modify something and we need to locate it first. We would like to eliminate the deficiencies and there could be, especially because it's a distributed system and it was optimized per module rather than holistically. Uh, conformance verification. So how do I know that one module is enforcing something like the other module? We would like to extract the documentation unless it exists, but I believe it doesn't exist because we are developers. We don't want to deal with documentation of ever changing projects, right? Uh, for module overview, so what are the dependencies between modules? Are there some relationships? Uh, we would like to do optimization. Very common, especially for the distributed system. We develop it, it scales, we deploy it, and then we get our first bill and we are not happy about it, right? How many of you have that experience? for security assessment, very big topic these days, and so on. So let's look one more slide before I pass off the word to my colleagues. So Profet is the tool that we are introducing and that we are developing and experimenting with. So the idea is to automate the extraction of software architecture reconstruction for microservice systems that are distributed. So how do we do that? Of course, it's a holistic. So we pretty much take each individual microservice we analyze it from the code perspective. Currently, we do that for Java platforms. And from there, we try to build a holistic model. And uh, we will learn in a second how to do that. 
but maybe I will mention one more thing. How do we do these things? Well, we could do code analysis with the source code or with the byte code. And we do both, actually. And it is a different use case. One fits very nicely to the continuous integration for the software development lifecycle. So if developer does something, we can uh, holistically assess the system if we have some functionality, which we have, and we will show you in a, in a bit. And the second option is that we actually do that on the bytecode level. So this goes to the integration for the Kubernetes, for instance, or Istio, and uh, the DevOps, uh, sorry, the SysOps could actually benefit out of this. So let's move on, and Dipta is going to tell you something about how, how Prophet works. So thank you, and enjoy. Thanks so much. Um, and so as we're kind of moving through these, we want to kind of talk a little bit to the, uh, you know, kind of the next speaker. Uh, so Dipta, tell us a little bit about uh, what you're doing currently at Baylor and, uh, you know, kind of how you might have got involved in the project. Yeah, so I am uh, doing my master's at Baylor and uh, since 2019. And since then, I am working with Dr. Chani and on this profit project. Cool. And what is it that attracted you to the project? Like, what did you find interesting? Uh, I think the most interesting part is uh, generating this uh, holistic picture of the microservices uh, some, with some kind of automated uh, process because it's uh, really important to automate the process uh, for a large number of microservices. Neat. Yeah, I yeah, I definitely agree. Um, you know, uh, why don't we let you kind of go on to talk about your uh, component of the project? Yeah, uh, you can go to the next slides. So as uh, Dr. Chan was discussing, Profit was uh, Profit is uh, merging the microservices. So uh, in Profit, we have like three perspective of mar merging the microservices. And the first one, we actually merge the data models and in the second step we uh, identify the remote calls or rest calls and merge them and in the third step we actually analyze the deployment descriptors or uh, conf uh, kubernetes configuration files to merge the microservices so we can go to the next slides where we will discuss about the bounded context so uh, we merge the bounded context which uh, which is done through the static code analysis for source code or bytecode uh, and then uh, for each microservice we extract the data models uh, and then we merge the data models together into one large uh, uh, data model so uh, we, we do so uh, by analyzing natural uh, by um, analyzing natural language processing or uh, finding the similarity between data models. The next slides, uh, we, yeah, yeah. Uh, in the next slide here, uh, we uh, talk about the uh, merging the REST interactions among the microservices. So here we also use the static code analysis, which is less costly and more faster. And this generates us the service view of the software architecture reconstruction, which I think Andrew will discuss more later. And uh, in this step, we have two phases. In the first phase, we scan the REST endpoints and REST calls of the microservices. And in the second phase, we match the URL, HTTP type, and parameters of REST endpoints and REST calls. In the next slide, we'll talk about the containerized microservices. Uh, so this is important because not always we have the access to the source code or byte code. And what we have, only the deployment files, for example, Kubernetes deployment files or Docker files. So it is still possible for us to generate this REST interaction graph for the container as microservices. So what we do for this, we analyze the Kubernetes uh, deployment files through a Kubernetes client, and we extract the container name, entry point path, and service discovery. After that, uh, we uh, extract the executable jar files from those containers uh, that is located on the entry point path. And we do so by mounting the Docker socket uh, into a separate container, which ensures that uh, the same container is being analyzed that is running on the Kubernetes cluster. After we extract the jar file or bytecode, uh, the next steps are the same as we did before. So in the next step, I think uh, Andrew will uh, discuss more about the software architecture reconstruction. Thanks, Dipta. Um, and uh, we'll give Andrew a second to, to click the right buttons. 
uh, and uh, thanks for being on the show with us. Um, and uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're doing at uh, Baylor? So could you tell us what got you involved in the project? Yeah, so I started working with Dr. Cherney a couple of years ago, and it was just kind of an exciting way to look at things beyond the classroom and what we don't want we get to work with. And then it gradually kind of grew into this thing that we realized had real ramifications in industry and had a lot of great applications. So, so, okay. So that's, that's really pretty cool. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you are uh, interpreting this? Sorry, what was that? Oh, I'm sorry. I think uh, we're getting uh, some inbound microphone. If somebody could check their mics and make sure they're not sharing their microphone. Um, so it's kind of odd. Uh, so uh, yeah, hopefully the audience is not hearing this and it's just us. Uh, why don't you uh, go ahead and uh, talk about uh, the interpretation that you do and I'll, I'll switch to the next slide. So what Dip is describing there is really a process called software architecture reconstruction. And this is where we construct a very simplified overview of an application. Now, as Dr. Cherney mentioned, this can really be done in a manual or an automatic way. And the vast majority right now is done manually. And this really isn't applicable for a microservice application because they just kind of get way too big and complicated and developers have a hard time understanding the entire system. And this is done in four phases. And to start with the extraction phase, this is where you get kind of the biggest divide between an automatic and a manual system. So the extraction is where you pull anything that you're gonna need for the different phases that are left in SAR. And this can be really anything. I mean, it's truly unlimited. It's just a matter of what kind of views you're wanting to build from SAR. And so in a manual way, you may pull things like UML diagrams or readmes or other, you know, BRDs, different documents about the application. In an automatic system, which we're doing, we kind of have to be a little more selective because we can't really interpret something like a UML diagram. Um, so we pull stuff like the code and the deployment di the documents, and we use those automatically through some like, you know, like static code analysis, dynamic code analysis, and that lets us create these different views. And so we move on to construction where we actually do that and we scan all these different source code and the related documents, and we construct the different views for each of the individual modules. At this point, we're just treating each module like its own little monolithic application, but in the next stage, which is manipulation, we're actually gonna start combining these different module kind of views in themselves. And so we're able to build a way more holistic picture by starting to match the different aspects of the different microservices. And so at the end of the manipulation phase, we have this huge overview of the application, which consists of a bunch of different views, which I'll get to on the next slide, but that lets us get into the analysis phase where the analysis phase is really just what questions do you wanna answer about an application? And again, this can be kind of whatever you want, what you build in the previous phases is really gonna depend on what questions you wanna answer. And later in the presentation, we'll demonstrate a couple questions that we've been able to answer with them. So Langdon, if you wanna, yeah. So I wanna talk briefly about the different views that we're going to be building. And basically, we have four that we focus on and we feel that this allows us to get the most bang for our buck basically and be able to kind of answer the most amount of questions with this minimal overhead. So the first one we do is the domain view, which is basically just all the entities of a system. And then we kind of go through this process of merging them using you know, some field matching, name matching, a little bit of NLP, and we kind of start to find the overlap in them and are able to identify, you know, kind of how they interact as a whole and build a giant domain model out of that, or kind of just see the overlap and see what are the commonalities like in figure one, where it just pulls out what's the same. We also have the technology view, which is where we kind of map all those, uh, you know, API calls between the different modules. 
and we're able to show the different dependencies based on API calls between the different microservices. We also have the service view, which is basically, um, sorry, I misspoke. The service view is all of the API calls between the different microservices. The technology view is what did you actually use to implement those microservices? And so this can be, you know, the very great thing about microservices is they can be implemented with whatever language you want, whatever version of the language you want, you know, whatever frameworks you want. But there does come a certain point where you may be going too diverse. And so that's something that we wanted to look at. And so the technology view is just what are you using for, you know, your front end or your data storage or, you know, the actual service layer architecture. And so then service view was the API calls and then operation view is kind of the deployment of the application. And so it's looking at things like the Docker images, Docker files, Kubernetes deployment, uh, configuration files, and just understanding how it is that the different microservices are deployed. Sorry, I also had to find the buttons to uh, come back on the screen. Uh, thanks so much, Andrew. Uh, and, uh, you know, hopefully that will be the end of our technical difficulties for the day, maybe for the conference. Uh, but we want to, you know, we want to hit it hard for you, uh, you know, or maybe one of our uh, speakers is actually on the trip to uh, Mars and uh, they got some background noise from that. Uh, Vincent, uh, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, and why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're doing at Baylor? Certainly. I am also a second year master's student at Baylor. I started in 2019 and I've been involved with um, Dr. Churney's lab and the profit project since the beginning of 2020. Cool. And what was it that uh, kind of attracted you to the project? What was interesting for you? Well, for me, it just seemed like a very practical project. Obviously, microservices are pretty much the de facto standard for a lot of new development, not all of it, but obviously a lot of things now depend on that. So anything to make that easier to understand and dissect, uh, especially for like um, onboarding new developers onto a project, making that faster. I thought that was a really cool thing. Neat, yeah, definitely, definitely a challenge. Um, so why don't we go ahead and get started with your uh, segment? All right, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, the project itself and the prototype we have deployed. This is just a uh, simple little demo of the project uh, prototype that we have right now. Um, so first off, we have a couple of different uh, test beds that we test against, a couple of repositories. The TMS project, what you see here, um, that's a simple in-house uh, microservice benchmark that we created. Very simple, just three services for a proof of concept type of thing. Um, the train ticket repository is actually a more extensive externally made repository. It's got about 40 microservices in it. So um, it's going to be a lot more extensive in the kinds of analysis and verification we do on it. Um, we're going to actually use that a little bit later on in the talk later. Um, but for now, we're just going to use the TMS for a simple demonstration. So right now in the visualization aspect of this, we're focusing on two different kinds of diagrams, uh, communication diagrams like you see here. And then below that, we also have context maps or domain diagrams. Um, and this is really just visualizing the results of the software architecture reconstruction process itself. So in this communication diagram, this is that service view that Andrew was mentioning. You see that we extract all the different services. You see the CMS, EMS, QMS, those are the three different services in the test bed. And then we extract all the different calls between them. So that's um, all the communication that happens among the microservices. You see that we get um, the HTTP methods and the methods that are called in the services. Below that, you have the context maps, and this is just an extracted domain diagram for the entire system. What we do is we find all of the entities, or all the objects that are acting as entities within each individual microservice, and we find its properties, relationships, et cetera. Um, each individual service has a different view of the data. So you can see below there, we have domain diagrams for each individual microservice. So we go into each microservice, find all of its entities and its relationships. And then we kind of aggregate those together into a single combined view. So we find what relationships exist among entities across the microservices. Um, and then we combine those into a single place. And both of those diagrams, again, are just visualizations um, of the software architecture reconstruction process. 
So on the next slide, um, I just have a, a bit more of a um, expounding on what I was saying there about the domain diagrams uh, and what we're doing. So if you have two different services that have these entities, so uh, service one has um, specifically looking at the question and entity, it's got a lot of relationships to a lot of other things. And then service two, the question entity doesn't have nearly as many relationships, but it has a new one that the first service doesn't have, the question to exam relationship. So essentially, we're just extracting those services or extracting those entities, and then we're combining them together in the combined result on the right. Um, you have all the extra relationships that service one has, but also the exam entity that was in service two. That's just a basic overview of what we're doing there. So on the next slide, what I want to talk about briefly is um, where we'll be going next. So if you can move to the next slide. So right now, as I mentioned, we're only um, visualizing that bare bones software architecture reconstruction itself, just the those different views that Andrew mentioned. In the future, um, what we're doing right now is analyzing different system concerns. So um, we're going to talk about security in just a second. We're going to talk about code quality through looking at code clones in a minute. These are other things that we want to analyze and that we also want to include in the visualization process. So we want to show a way to um, share that information with the user. We also want to look into some other formats. One thing that we ran into when we were analyzing the 4D microservice benchmark is that 2D graphs get very limited very quickly in the information that they can concisely display. So we want to look into some other formats, um, for example, using 3D or some kind of um, AR or VR setup in order to help users kind of navigate these microservice meshes. We also want to make it a bit more interactive of a process. So allowing users to form some kind of query about what exactly they're looking for. So they'll be able to narrow down the results instead of, well, they'll be able to start with the large overall graph, but then be able to slice it down to what specific services are they interested in, what concerns do they want to look at, and what relationships between the microservices are they specifically interested in. So those are the kinds of things that we'll be pushing uh, in the future on this project. Back to you, Langdon. So we can expect to see a, a VR version of this in the VR uh, for the conference, um, is what you're saying? So if we go... Right, yeah, it's live right now. You can, you yeah, can go into exactly. the matrix right now and hack with this and, all you want. Right, right, good to know. Um, well, thanks so much. Uh, and uh, we'd like to welcome uh, Dipta back to talk about uh, kind of uh, some example uses. We're gonna go through a couple of different uh, scenarios and Dipta is gonna lead us off with endpoint security. Yeah, so uh, in the next slide, we are going to discuss about uh, some application of the software architecture reconstruction that uh, Prophet was doing. So one of them is uh, analyzing the RBAC inconsistency in the API endpoints. So we defined five uh, different kind of uh, violation or inconsistency related to RBAC policies. So the first one is missing role violations, which happens when one API endpoint do not have any uh, RBAC uh, roles associated with it. So it can be false positive because some endpoints are really public and that is intentional. However, sometimes developer forget to uh, provide those uh, API roles on the API endpoints. And the second one is unknown access violation. Uh, that happens when you define a RBAC role on an API endpoint, but that RBAC role doesn't present in your role hierarchy as, uh, role hierarchy, as the role hierarchy shown in the left. Uh, in the right. And then the third one is entity access violation, which happens when uh, two API endpoints have same input and output. That means they have the same response type and request type, but they have uh, different uh, RBAC roles. And these three uh, uh, violation happens for the endpoint methods. And the next two, conflicting hierarchy violation and unrelated access violation happens for the intermediate methods. So when an intermediate method uh, have two different roles uh, that are uh, that are uh, ancestor of each others, for example, user and admin, they are the ancestor of each others. Uh, when this happens, we call this conflicting hierarchy violations. And when two 
different uh, intermediate method have uh, one intermediate method have uh, two roles that are in different subtrees. For example, users, uh, user and uh, moderator. These two roles are in different subtree. We call this unrelated access violation. So in the next slide, uh, we uh, talk about how we detect these kind of violations. So first we extract the rest interaction graph and method call graph by using the static code analysis. And we also extract the RBAC roles associated to each API endpoints. After that, we combine the method call graphs by utilizing the rest interaction graph. And then we perform reduction where we just keep the lowest role of each API endpoints. And then in the aggregation phase, we push the role from the root to the leaf node of the method combined method call graph. And then we analyze each intermediate nodes and each API endpoint nodes of the combined method call graph uh, for, and look for those violations. The next step, in the next slide, we talk about how this combined method call graph is prepared. So you can see that we have the application X and it contains all the jar files. So we assume that each jar file um, describe one microservices. So here we, in the discovery module, we have the mic uh, microservice A and microservice B, and we have the method call, separate method call graphs of those two microservices. And then the, after the flow matcher module, we have the rest interaction between these two microservices, what is shown with the arrow, and this is a get request uh, as indicating in the arrow. And then after the analysis module, uh, we perform aggregation and reduction. And here you can see uh, all the method call graphs are actually combined into one uh, by analyzing or by using the rest interaction graph. And in the next slide, we talk about how we are performing the aggregation and reduction. So here you can see uh, uh, in the role, uh, we have the controller method one, which have role A, B, C, and the controller method two, which have role PQ. And in the, after the reduction phase, we just keep the lowest one. That means uh, C from ABC and Q from the PQ, uh, uh, based on the uh, role hierarchy graph on the left. And then after the aggregation phase, we push down all the roles from the root to leaf. And we also combine uh, the role C and Q in the repository method zero one. So here, the repository methods 01 have the two, uh, two different roles, C and Q, and we can see that C and Q are in the different subtree of the role hierarchy graph. So we can call this as unrelated access violation. And in the next slide, we have a small demo how we are uh, running this application to detect against a test bed. So long run, can you just play it in the full screen? Yeah, so here on the left, uh, we are running our application and on the right, we will compile our microservices. So this is a Spring Boot project. So we just run Maven Spring Boot run and it will run our project on the 8080 port. And on the right, we have the TMS testbed. Uh, this is the same testbed uh, Vincent was uh, talking about. So let's see uh, what do we have inside this project. So you can see we have four different microservices, CMS, EMS, UMS and UMS all uh, have separate folder and there is a build script. So we just run this build script and it will prepare the jar files for each microservices. So it will uh, take some time to compile all those microservices one by one and prepare the jar file for each microservices. So as you can see, we are building the CMS and now it is building the EMS project. And then it is building the QMS project. So all four microservices are uh, prepared uh, for analysis. And then we'll send just send a REST request. And here we can see uh, it is the past uh, path to the jar files where all the microservices or all the jar files are located. It's the same path here. And then uh, this organization path is actually used to filter out unnecessary or third party libraries because we just want to analyze our own project, not the third party libraries. And then in the security analyzer interface, we define or we uh, specify the role hierarchy graph as we saw earlier. And in the output part is the where we actually generate the graph base file. Here we got the response 
uh, from our replication and all security method actually contains the metadata after aggregation and reduction. So we are not actually interested in this. We are mainly interested in the constraints violation here. So as you can see, the constraints violation, uh, we have all those uh, inconsistency or violation. And here you can see the con create configuration method have two roles, admin and users. And those are actually uh, ancestor of each other. So we call this uh, hierarchy access violation. And similarly, uh, in the find all configuration method, uh, we have moderator and user role after aggregation and reduction. And these two moderator and users are actually in two different subtrees of the role hierarchy graph. So we call this an unrelated access violation. And finally, uh, let's see the output path. It's in the download folder. So just move into the download folder. Uh, here you can see the grubbiz file is generated. We'll open this. And here's the grubbiz file. We we'll just visualize it. And it will show the REST interaction graph uh, among the microservices along with all other configurations. So it is the same <clears throat> uh, thing as Vincent was uh, showing with, uh, with a little bit more details. So thank you for watching this demo. It's longer to you. Apologies for that. I'm not sure why it's uh, decided to act up on me. Um, apparently, it's the technical difficulty day. Um, so uh, we'd like to welcome uh, Andrew back uh, to talk about code smells. Um, and this one is a, a true test for me, uh, where we are going to go rapidly through uh, various uh, code smell examples. So uh, Andrew, go ahead and take it away. Yeah, thank you. So. It's always great to hear Dipta talking about, you know, very applicable things like security, RBAC, role consistency. Um, but I like to talk about things that aren't so perilous, but equally as important. And it's something that a lot of developers, I think, don't really take into consideration. And that's code smells. So I know no one really likes to deal with code smells because they're really just poor programming practice. They don't really impact the functionality of an application but they do impact the reusability, the testability, and the maintainability. And so it's something that people need to be aware of, but it's often difficult to kind of lock them down and even more so in microservices. So next slide. Yeah, so microservices are kind of unique because not only does each individual module have all of your traditional code smells, you also have microservice specific code smells that deal with kind of the interaction of the modules and not just the code within them. And so traditional tools really can't work on these because you need a way of generating a holistic view of the application in order to find these. So that's where our SAR process comes in and we're actually able to find them. So I wanna go through the 11 code smells that we detect and Hopefully you recognize them, but don't think to yourself, oh, this is something that I just did on the application I'm working on. Um, but I just want to demonstrate that these are things that are important and can be found with our process. So to kick things off, we have enterprise service bus usage. I know ESBs used to be fairly popular back in like service oriented architecture, but now they are considered bad practice. They provide a pretty single point of failure, which is not something that we want. So you want to avoid using those. We have too many standards, kind of like what I was mentioning previously, you know, you can have anything you want to implement your different microservices, but at a certain point, you may be getting too diverse and you need to kind of rein it back so that it's more seamless for your developers. Wrong cuts is kind of a tricky one. It's where your microservices are cut along the presentation, business, and data layers of an application instead of by feature. So you really want to make sure that they're cut along the features and each microservice has its own presentation, business, and data within it. Not having an API gateway is another big one. Now, if it's a really small application, you're probably fine. But research has shown that over 50 microservices and developers are no longer able to accurately keep track of the system. So at that point, you want to start using an API gateway just to make it simpler on everyone. API versioning, 
uh, you should be versioning your APIs. It's helpful for everyone involved, you know, QA, deployment, users, developers, everyone benefits from having a versioned API. Microservice Greedy is another interesting one. It's a little subjective. It's where you have so many tiny microservices that it gets to be a little unwieldy and it would be better to just kind of aggregate a couple of them into some larger microservices that are better suited and easier to manage. Shared persistency is where two different microservices are accessing the same data in a database. Hard-coded endpoints is when you hard-code an endpoint that you call um, specifically around stuff like IP and port, because once you start deploying, that can always change. And it's something that is way too brittle for a real enterprise application. Inappropriate service intimacy is kind of similar to shared persistency, but it's a little different. It's where each microservice has its own database, but one of them is also accessing some private data within another's database. And usually this is done just because it's the easy way out and developers are lazy and don't want to write the proper channels to get that data. Um, but this one in particular is really bad and you want to avoid it. Shared libraries is another where if a lot of microservices are using the same library, it might be better suited to be deployed as its own microservice and then could be scaled as needed. Cyclic dependency is super self-explanatory. It's where your chain of API calls winds up making a cycle between microservices. And that's all 11 of them. Again, hopefully you recognize them, but don't think that you've implemented any of them recently. Um, if you want to check, we do have a publicly open source tool called MSA Nodes at our lab's GitHub repository. You know, and we always welcome feedback and pull requests and, you know, anything like that. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Langdon. Thanks so much. Um, I don't think I screwed it up too badly, so that's nice. Um, and uh, so what we'd like to do is uh, welcome our next speaker. Um, so, uh, Michael, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, why you're at Baylor or what you're doing at Baylor? Yeah, so I'm actually in my first year of uh, the graduate program at Baylor University. I actually just graduated there last May with my undergrad. Uh, I was in the same class as Andrew. And so I decided to come back and learn a little more from Dr. Cherney and the rest of the people at Baylor. Do it all again. Uh, so what attracted you to uh, this particular project? Yeah, so um, in my undergrad, um, Andrew and I, uh, we began study on uh, the limitations of static code analysis. And so I, I really got intrigued by that, especially since a lot of people don't really use static code analysis, at least not as much as they should be using in their software. And uh, it's because of these limitations that uh, are present. And so from this, um, I was able to branch out and kind of look at the limitations of these static code analysis tools over microservices, which is what I'll be talking to you guys about today. Cool. Yeah. So uh, why don't you uh, go ahead and take it away and uh, tell us about uh, the work you're, you're planning on doing for your, I think, for your master's, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So as I just said with Landon, there are limitations in static code analysis. Here I'm focusing on the limitations of static application security testing over microservices. So static application security testing is used to find vulnerabilities in software. However, this form of testing is not enough to gain coverage of security vulnerabilities in microservices. So since the static application security testing only looks at the source code of software, it can miss potential vulnerabilities that might exist due to the communication between modules that is present in a microservice architecture. Due to this limitation, developers are required to use dynamic application security testing to find the vulnerabilities that the static form were unable to detect. So the problem with this is that the, is that the dynamic application security testing is a much more costly form of testing than static application security testing due to its dynamic nature. So that is why we've begun research to find a way to limit this need for dynamic application security testing. So in order to limit this need, we need to we have found 
that we can combine static application security testing with software architecture reconstruction in order to gain more coverage of the security vulnerabilities that might become present due to microservice and interconnectivity. So we plan on combining the profit tool that we've discussed earlier with the Fabricate Analytics Quality Assurance tool in order to achieve this goal. So the, Fabricates Analytics, the Fabricate Analytics Quality Assurance tool acts as a framework for static code analysis tools, which will allow us to customize our testing to get the best coverage out of the static application security testing tools that we are using. Now, in this study, we intend on showing how this combination can limit the need for the costly dynamic application security testing that I had mentioned earlier. So like, like Landon, Landon said, this is just preliminary research that we've begun over this, and I'm excited in uh, trying to figure out exactly how this is going to work and in uh, writing up this for my thesis. Awesome. Uh, thanks so much. Um, so I think that was pretty much the kind of content we kind of had for you today. Uh, and we are basically over time. So uh, I wanted to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Cherney back to the stage for a minute, um, just to kind of say, hey, you know, as per all open source, looking for PRs, looking for more people to get involved, please do. Uh, and, uh, you know, Dr. Cherney, do you want to uh, kind of give your plea for how, how awesome this could be? Oh, yeah. I would like to thank everyone that they joined us today. And of course, you know, get your hands on. I'm sure that you are bored with what you have been doing, let's say, for a couple of months. And if you have a Friday afternoon off, anything like that, you could join us. We would be very happy. We are looking for collaborators. So you can participate on the grants as, a, as a, some advanced collaborator who has the technical knowledge who is exposed to uh, practice. We would love to help um, your help and work with you on some tasks that you perhaps uh, can define. So you can come and say, hey, guys, you know, we don't really have time to do that, but I think this would be a great project. What we also have been doing is to uh, employ some Red Hat volunteers as uh, co-supervisors. So I have been working with multiple of you uh, already on some projects uh, that you are doing. And we had summer research that we are doing with Red Hat, which is very exciting and in fact, Andrew and Michael came from, from that uh, sort of incubation uh, of uh, being good developers eventually. And we are looking for transition to practice. So all these things really just reach out. We will be more than happy. And there is never a bad idea. There is never a bad question. Uh, so thanks so much for giving the talk. Um, as I said, we're pretty much out of time. So if you had any questions, um, please try to find us either on kind of the general chat inside uh, hop in, which I know is kind of rough. Um, or if uh, you can find us in the keynote questions uh, channel in Discord. Um, there's so many now instant messaging platforms that uh, I have to think about which one I'm currently talking about. Um, so in the Discord, uh, I will at least be there or we can follow up with the, any questions that you might have later. Um, and I would also like to thank the presentation and power gods that we just had a couple of technical difficulties. All of our speakers were in Texas, uh, which is currently having rolling blackouts in a lot of places. Uh, so I am very happy that we were able to uh, be this successful successful, even if we had a couple of challenges. Uh, so thanks so much for your time. And uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of DevConf. Uh, don't forget to uh, participate in the kind of extra events, you know, as well as going to the talks, um, you know, and uh, get your yoga on. And uh, we'll uh, see you uh, around. Thanks so much. Thank you, Langdon. <laughs>